The deployment of UN peacekeepers is always a response to a crisis. It is always because something is happening and the international community needs to respond. Peacekeeping missions continue to face significant challenges when it comes to the protection of civilians. Reports and lessons learned studies in the last decade identified many gaps throughout the entire process of planning for, deploying and managing a peacekeeping mission. These needed to be addressed. We are deployed in situations where our mandate can be very strongly challenged by forces that from time to time can also challenge the government. This, this is very new in peacekeeping. But what is clear is that we have drawn the line between peacekeeping and peace enforcement. We want to stay in peacekeeping, even though we can have sequences where we are very, very robust. We're not uh, seeing armies uh, fighting each other. We are seeing uh, militias with uh, unclear chains of command, with little accountability. So it's much more complicated than monitoring a ceasefire, let's say, between two armies. Now, what it is about is assessing the threat of a militia, sometimes being able to deter that militia, sometimes being able to actually take action against that militia. Who are the civilians? We have different groups of civilians in a the theater. We have UN civilian personnel on the ground who need protection. Anybody who is unarmed in a peacekeeping theater could be considered a civilian in danger because he could be victim of, let's say, the armed conflict around him. And the requirements for each group is different. The reason that POC is so challenging is because it's not a task you can just give to one entity and say, go and protect civilians. Because there's so many actors involved in it. The most important actors, by the way, and the ones that are most forgotten in this, are the communities themselves. If communities are not involved, then it doesn't matter what a peacekeeping mission does, they won't be leaving a lasting peace. The type of conflict situations that we're going into to protect the civilian population are becoming more extreme. And the traditional concept of a non-partisan neutral peace support operation, I'm not sure that they hold entirely anymore. The government is an actor in the conflict and they're the ones guiding, for example, where UN peacekeepers can work. So one of the things that we're always pushing for is that if it's a UN peacekeeping mission, should keep promoting access everywhere and not sit back and allow the government just to dictate. Peacekeepers are faced with increasingly complex operational environments, often with limited resources to carry out their tasks. The unfortunate reality is that peacekeeping operations cannot protect everyone from everything all of the time. There is a need to manage expectations. Just for this small part of the Congo, it means 18 peacekeepers to protect 10,000 people. Despite the fact that there's lots of expectation on new mission, we are not able to protect everyone from everything. It's fair to say that there will never be enough resources. Um, we're deployed in vast areas, um, there are huge population groups, and we will never be able to provide 100% protection. Um, I think what people who are suffering from violence are looking for from the mission is, is hope and the sense that the mission is making a difference. Even if we don't have all the resources that we need, the mission needs to be seen to be doing its utmost. The military, the police, the civilian leadership, to be active, to be putting itself on the line. The discipline of peacekeepers and their respect for the law must be upheld. Failure to do this can seriously impact on the ability of the mission to do its work and of peacekeepers to provide protection. Each contingent of a peace contributing country to a peace mission is bound by its national military law. For the legal obligations prohibiting sexual abuse and exploitation, for example, are a really important part of, of, of this obligation. And it's for troop contributing countries when a member of a national contingent in a peace mission violates legal obligations like that to investigate that alleged violation. Even one case 
of uh, a peacekeeper uh, abusing uh, a, a woman somewhere um, destroys a lot of the credibility of the whole international community. In their efforts to protect civilians, uniformed components of peacekeeping missions perform an important role in enabling other actors to carry out their protection tasks. They often create a safe and secure environment which allows other actors to deliver important humanitarian assistance. However, close coordination can give rise to tensions, given that humanitarian actors sometimes feel that perceptions of their neutrality might be compromised by close affiliation with the mission's military component. Very often, what puts people's lives at stake and very often at high risk is the lack of things like medication, food. After the war, most people are starving. There are no hospitals. Mothers deliver and may die during childbirth. The material needs of people is something the world hasn't quite found a solution to. We work in situations where these actors actually see humanitarian agencies as part of the problem. They see them as uh, aligned in one way or another, either with the government they may be fighting against, or they see them as deliverers of aid, which uh, is a very valuable commodity and can affect the whole balance of power between the governments and, and those who are fighting them. So we become inevitably uh, seen to be party principles of one sort or another. It's extremely important that when we speak of protection, not everybody tries to do the same thing. Yes, there are lessons learned, but let's not all kind of jump to trying to have the same methodology. This will not be to the benefit of the population.